Police will sometimes use stings in order to arrest multiple suspects at once. Using a sting, for example, attracting in suspects by convincing them that they've won some sort of contest, can allow an arrest in a more controlled and safer setting and can prevent arrested suspects from warning other suspects that the police might be coming for them. And in the annals of these kinds of stings, one is legendary, is still used to train police departments how to set up and execute that kind of sting. The 1990 Flint, Michigan wedding sting is history that deserves to be remembered. The 1980s began a period of what has been called the decline of Detroit. The automobile industry, the backbone of the area economy, was seeing dual trends, increasing automation and increasing decentralization of manufacturing. The once large plants that drove the Motor City were closing, as well as hundreds of businesses that were dependent upon them. In 1986, General Motors announced that it would close seven major Detroit area plants. Further economic trends, increasing fuel costs, increasing foreign competition, only contributed to the industry decline as manufacturers sought production efficiencies and reduced labor costs. The city was unable to effectively diversify its economy and fell into decline. The Detroit population declined rapidly from approximately 1,850,000 in 1950 to just over a million in 1990. As the economic prospects of the greater Detroit area declined, problems with crime increased, and most especially, drug crimes. The area was seeing increased trade in cocaine, marijuana, LSD, and prescription pills, along with all the associated violent crimes and social ills. Police departments, whose economic fortunes declined along with the tax base, struggled to deal with the problem. Arresting a drug dealer and making it stick was not simple. If the police only demonstrate one sale, a defense lawyer can argue that it was entrapment. To have the best chance of a conviction, the police needed to demonstrate that the person engaged in regular trade in illegal narcotics. And the best way to do that was to become a regular customer. Debbie Williams was a 38-year-old Flint City, Michigan police officer who, among other skills, had the advantage of looking nothing like a Flint City, Michigan police officer. Lacey Moon Brown was an independent investigator who had come to law enforcement after a checkered past of his own. Part of a multi-department area task force that was tasked with trying to identify and arrest local drug dealers, they were a couple that no one would have suspected were undercover police officers. Brown had gotten a bad conduct discharge from the Marines and had a string of encounters with the law. According to a 1991 profile in the Detroit Free Press, in 1972 he was at rock bottom and facing serious prison time when he made a deal. Get me out of here, Jesus, and I'll change. The charge he was facing was reduced to a misdemeanor, and he took that as a sign. While taking law enforcement classes at Mott Community College in Flint, Michigan, he was recruited by a Flint vice detective as someone who so did not look like a cop that he could help local police find and shut down after hours joints. His style was to act as unpolice-like as possible, and he seemed to thrive on the adrenaline of the challenge. He got into one place by urinating on the house, prompting them to let him in in order to prevent him drawing attention. His nickname, Moon, came reportedly because of his tendency to drop his trousers during parties. He reasoned, if I moon them, they're not going to think I'm a cop. He worked undercover as a Lapeer County Sheriff's Deputy for five years, but when his cover was blown, he chose to become a freelance detective rather than take a desk job. He worked with area departments, usually for a flat fee. Police who knew him during his 18-year undercover career described him as one of the best undercover officers they had ever seen. The idea of placing Moon and Williams undercover as a couple was to embed them in the culture and gain the trust of Detroit area dealers. Working with their handler, Maurice Vic Wasilishan, a sergeant in the Shiawassee County Sheriff's Department, they created false backgrounds. Williams played Debbie Leno, the daughter of a New York gangster named Fast Eddie Leno. Brown played her boyfriend Danny, a man who bought so many drugs that dealers assumed that he was part of a larger drug operation associated with Fast Eddie. Their ploy was astoundingly effective. Over a five-month period, they made a remarkable 163 individual buys from over 87 different dealers. They were running a significant risk, but they had created such believable personas that they were immediately accepted as part of the community. That was not uncommon for Moon, who was so believable that his victims often couldn't believe that they were being arrested even as they were being placed in handcuffs. Wasilishan described him as the type of guy who could sell a cow to a vegetarian. 
Having identified and gathered evidence on dozens of suspects, they had a new problem. Local area departments did not have the resources to arrest so many suspects at once, and if you arrest even one of them, the others will get suspicious, flush their stashes, and disappear. They needed some way to get them all at once. The idea came from Boone Brown. Brown had used subterfuge in the past. He had arrested a man who had brokered stolen property and then sent out a story that the man had died. His criminal associates were arrested as they showed up for the funeral. Brown, who was set to retire and wanted to go out with a bang, pitched an idea to Wasilishan. How about we stage a wedding? After getting approval from the prosecutor's office, they planned one of the most famous stings in police history. In fact, Moon Brown was already married. As perhaps the greatest evidence of his undercover prowess, he had met his wife while he was working undercover, and she had agreed to marry him even though his undercover operation had eventually netted nearly a hundred arrests, including her own brother. Planning a wedding, even a fake one, on a budget is not an easy task. Not only did local departments not have a lot of money, but making a request for money from local governments in tight-knit communities for an undercover sting could blow the operation. Although it took some convincing, Wasilishan managed to get funding from his boss, Shiawassee County Sheriff Big Jim LaJoy, himself a former undercover detective. The wedding planning was almost surreal given the setting. The team of officers had to plan a real wedding while still trying to keep the operation secret. In 2015, 25 years after the sting, Williams told The Atlantic Magazine that, I started feeling that stress like you would feel for a real wedding. They had to arrange caterers, flowers, invitations, seating arrangements. Much of the material was donated, but money was tight. To save money, the top two layers of the cake were made out of frosted cardboard. Williams' wedding dress was acquired at a second-hand store for $17. Brown's real wife, Beth, helped her pick it out. It came with a leg garter that she used to hold her service revolver. The wedding would be the first time in his life that Brown had ever worn a tuxedo. The team did not alert the reception hall, Moore's Family Circle Hall in Corona, Michigan, chosen because it was in a controllable and reasonably remote location, and of course, within the wedding budget, that it was a police operation. The sting was an all-hands-on-deck moment. The role of Fast Eddie, Williams' New York mobster father, eager to give his daughter the best wedding ever, would be played by Davidson Township Chief of Police. He rolled into town in a big motorhome with fake Florida plates. A retired Flint City police sergeant played the role of the minister. The band was made up of police officers, posing as a pro-weed group named Spock, S-P-O-C, for Somebody Protect Our Crops. The name spelled backwards was, of course, Cops. The group was led by a Davison City police officer. It was difficult finding enough officers who could play an instrument, and the band was described as truly horrible. Perhaps the oddest member of the party was Moon's wife, Beth, who played the maid of honor. They all knew that they were running a risk dealing with potentially violent suspects. Even Moon and Beth's son, who the morning of the sting, September 21st, 1990, left a note on his dad's bedstand written in purple crayon. It said, be careful, daddy. The first part of the sting was a reverse buy. A week before the wedding, Moon and a Port Huron undercover detective, playing his drug connection, went around town showing off a large load of marijuana, actually weed that had been seized by the Flint City Police Department. They told local dealers that the load that they were carrying had been sold, but that another one was going to be delivered. Anyone who wanted in could purchase product before the wedding. The day of the wedding, dealers came in by appointment. After they paid cash for the product and it was put in their trunk, all of that caught on videotape, Armed officers would rush out and arrest them, moving them out of sight before the next appointment. They confiscated over $100,000, and because of seizure statutes, that money could go to drug enforcement operations. When the time for the wedding arrived, the son at the front asked guests to check their guns or leave them outside, although officers on the scene said it was clear that many of the guests were still packing, as were the dozen undercover police officers among them. There were bricks of marijuana on a table, supposedly to be raffled for $100 tickets. The wedding included an open bar, a dangerous idea with armed drug dealers, but the idea was to get them to relax and let down their guard. They continued to drink as Debbie walked down the aisle, escorted by her proud fake father, Fast Eddie. Many of the invited guests would not arrive until the reception, and the plan was to get as many there as possible before staging the raid. As the party got into full swing, including fake speeches and toasts, more and more guests arrived. They cut the cake, careful not to cut into the cardboard part. The decorations were an inside joke, ribbons that were police blue and little sugar bumblebees, referring to the sting. Matchbooks at the tables read, thanks, 
for sharing our joy. When finally enough of the guests had arrived, Phil Shooter McCarthy, the undercover officer who was playing Moon's drug connection, came up to the microphone like he was going to give another wedding speech and said, let's all have some fun. Everyone in the room who's a cop, please stand up. As a dozen undercover officers stood up, he said, the rest you all put your hands on the table. You're under arrest. This is a bust. Then the band played the signal, the song, I fought the law and the law won. And the uniformed officers sprang from hiding to collect up the suspects. As Williams and Brown pointed out suspects, some were laughing, still believing that it was a joke. About a dozen were arrested on the scene, many more in the following days. It is unclear how many were convicted as a result of the sting. Records were not on computer at the time, but officers described the conviction rate as high. Several suspects made claims of entrapment, but all but one were thrown out. Reports from the Times suggest that the large number of arrests overwhelmed local courts and prosecutors were forced to plead out many cases. While the sting had netted a large network of dealers, the area economy continued to decline and crime continued to increase. There were police stings before the wedding sting and there have been many after, but the 1990 Flint, Michigan wedding sting is still legendary among police departments for its planning and execution and still used to train departments across the country today. Moon Brown explained that despite the fact that there were tongue-in-cheek elements like naming the band Cops spelled backwards, there was no attempt to humiliate suspects. It wasn't fun, he said. It was just good police work. One surprising result of the operation, Vic Wasilishin was in the mobile home which had been used as part of the scam and was being used as a command post the night of the sting when Debbie Williams walked in wearing her $17 wedding dress. Years later he told the Tri-County Times it was then that he realized that he was in love with her. The two married the next year, as of 2015, were still living in the Flint area. After the arrests were made, the police used the remaining food and drink at the reception hall to celebrate the retirement of Lacey Moon Brown. His 18 years of undercover work was celebrated in a 1991 profile in the Detroit Free Press. Despite a job that often put him at risk and even at one point included threats to his family, Lacey Brown rarely made even a living wage as an independent investigator. Some months he only made $500. For the entirety of the operation that culminated in the wedding sting in 1990, he was only paid $10,000 for six months of work. He used that to put a down payment on some land in North Carolina near his birthplace where he could retire. Lacey Moon Brown, the legendary undercover detective, passed away in 2006 at the age of 63. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.